recording this session, um, um, which um, will be shared as a resource primarily in the campus community, um, but just so you know. And um, lastly, we have reserved time in the agenda for questions for Congressman Waxman. Um, the question should be submitted via the Q&A window near the bottom of your screen. Um, please note the question submitted uh, via the Q&A may be visible to others um, as well. Um, in Mark Twain's off -quoted, often quoted line, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, we are reminded that while we often are captives of our time and the moments we live in, it is a fool's folly to declare no interest or no need to know what came before. Scientists, artists, craftswomen, scholars of all disciplines understand the necessity of building upon the lessons of the past, be they successes and or failures. And even some politicians understand this too. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Henry Waxman. Congressman Waxman served for 40 years in the House of Representatives, chairing some of the most powerful committees, including oversight, waste, fraud, and abuse, and leaving a legacy that, among others, included spearheading legislation that took on the tobacco lobby, championing the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990, being a primary architect of the Affordable Care Act, and, of course, why we're here tonight, sponsoring the Ryan White Cares Act, from whose lens, at a distance, we can better understand the role of government in public health outbreaks including what approaches for better or worse are being repeated, which are rhyming, and perhaps considering where we might go from here. And joining Congressman Waxman in conversation, as Betsy mentioned, is Edward Fitzpatrick from the Boston Globe, and he will serve as tonight's interlocutor. So please welcome Henry and, and Ed. Thank you for inviting us, and uh, this ought to be a great uh, conversation. We'll have some time at the end for Q&A from the people tuning in tonight. Um, and just to set the stage, I wanted to uh, begin by just asking the Congressman if he could outline, for, for those not familiar, the role you played, the important role you played in addressing the AIDS epidemic. And you know what, if you could identify some of the lessons that can be drawn from that experience as we face the, the coronavirus pandemic today. In 1981, uh, there was a disease that was a, 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 a particular cancer, a very rare cancer, and it was affecting gay men. The Center for Disease Control was keeping track of it, and it was multiplying geometrically. They didn't know what it was, and they were very worried about it. They said that there was some kind of acquired immune response from this disease, and that it was fatal. Uh, so we uh, heard about it. We didn't know what to make of it either. But I called the, the first hearing on this issue at the, the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Service Center. And we heard from gay men who were getting the disease. We heard from some of the medical people at UCLA who were treating patients with this disease. It was all very disturbing. Uh, and that was the very first time we heard of what later became AIDS, the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Uh, we held a number of hearings in Washington. We tried to get as much information as we could, but uh, the victims of this disease were stigmatized rather than what we see now with COBRA, where people are so upset at the, the death of so, of so many people, 200,000 now is our mark in the United States. There's a great deal of sympathy for them and their families. But when it came to AIDS, there was very little sympathy. People were afraid that they were going to catch the disease. They uh, realized that it was gay men. And then HIV, uh, HIV was also affecting uh, drug users, IV drug users. And a, a little known fact was that Haitians in the United States were uh, coming down with AIDS. No one could understand why that was the case, but those were the three groups that were getting the AIDS disease. Uh, as opposed to COVID, where it spreads very rapidly to anybody. We didn't know if that was gonna be the case with AIDS, 
we were worried about it. And there were people who stirred the pot about it because they said, oh, these are, these are gay men. Uh, we shouldn't worry about them. It's not going to affect others. Uh, and in fact, President Reagan wouldn't even say the word AIDS until the end of his term when Elizabeth Taylor went to see him and said, you've got to talk about this disease. You can't ignore it. You've got to at least talk about it. And she went through a list of their friends from the, the motion picture industry that were, had died from AIDS. And then he made some mention of it after that. Well, we got involved because of that. And, uh, and I wanted to introduce legislation right away to provide more money for research. But we couldn't get any, we couldn't get support for that. People didn't want to spend money on this disease. Uh, we uh, then said, well, let's not do it for this disease. Let's do it for any disease that uh, happens to a lot of people and multiplies as rapidly as this disease is multiplying. We didn't talk about AIDS. So it was the ability for the, the, the health services in the United States to do something about a disease that suddenly appears. And that we got through. We tried to work on the uh, legislation that became the Ryan White AIDS Act. And um, we didn't get that through until 1990. Now realize 1981, we started hearing about the first cases. We passed a bill before 1990, but it was vetoed by Senator Jesse Helms, very, very right wing senator uh, from North Carolina. And he said, if you talk about this disease, you're only going to be encourage, encouraging men to engage in gay sex. And he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, and it took long behind us with, to do uh, it. The, the act that ended up being passed was the Ryan White Care Act. Who was yeah. Ryan White and how was yeah. the bill after him key to winning approval of that legislation? Ryan White was a teenage boy from Indiana who uh, came down with AIDS and he seemed to come down with this disease because of uh, some surgical procedure that left him with the infection uh, for, from HIV and AIDS. And there was a lot of sympathy because at first people didn't want to let him go to school. But the scientists were saying He's not going to pass on this disease by simply being with other people. It, it, the disease was transmitted through uh, sex or sharing needles and not by simply being in a classroom. So there was a lot of sympathy for uh, Ryan White and what he was going through. And when we finally passed the bill, we had, um, uh, we, we had uh, a, a senator from... Indiana that we were trying to impress Dan Coates, with right? Dan Coates, who just finished his term as the as the uh, intelligence czar. I don't know the precise name for it, but they they were people were worried about Dan Coates, but they thought if we named it after Ryan White, it would be very hard for him to vote against the bill. I, that wasn't my idea. It was Senator Hatch and other people in the Senate. So we named it the Ryan White AIDS Act. And the uh, gay men who had the disease, which certainly were far more than uh, Ryan White, wanted that done because Ryan White and his mother were working so actively to uh, inform and educate the public about this disease. And uh, Ryan White, by that time, had passed away from uh, AIDS. I, I got a sense of the, the battle at that time uh, from a Politico magazine article by Timothy Westmoreland, who described the subcommittee proceedings that were, were going yes. on as a roller coaster from indifference to panic to indifference um, again. He, he said one day there'll be no members of the AIDS he hearing at all and just the chairman presiding. The next day there were so many cameras, the networks had to band together to have a pool reporter one day. Um, they'd be talking about one white blood cells. The next day, Elizabeth Taylor was testifying. C. Everett Koop was saying things. And, and Westmoreland's point was that throughout the whole course of this process, you kept focus asking over and over, 
what did the public health people say should be done next? Yeah. So in what ways um, do we find ourselves in a similar situation with COVID-19? And are we asking that question? What, what did the public health people say should be done next? Well, we, we ask that over and over again, dealing with AIDS. Was, AIDS was the disease, but HIV, we found out, was a, 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 a pre, preliminary uh, position that allowed AIDS to come in. And so it was. Uh, he, uh, so the so the HIV and AIDS became closely tied together. Uh, there there was uh, a, a lot of concern about what was happening, but uh, people were looking at it either terrified that they were going to get AIDS. There was one congressman named Dan Burton who went to the house barbershop with his own scissors and hairbrush because he didn't want to be using the, the one that the barber had. Uh, there were people acting very, very strange. There were those who were being uh, telling interviewers that this is a disease that you could just catch by being in the same room. So that, of course, terrified people. But uh, that, a lot of mistruths were being spread about the disease itself and, and people were very frightened. We had leadership from the health people in the Reagan administration, uh, both the career people and his appointees. President Reagan wouldn't talk about the disease uh, and the health people were restricted in what they could say by the political people in the administration. So I would ask them when they testified, in your medical judgment, because it was their personal medical judgment that I wanted, uh, do you think we ought to do this or do you think we ought to do that? And then they were able to give us the testimony that the administration didn't want them to give. Uh, but the public paid a lot of attention when there was a, a suggestion that they are at risk. Then when there was not any suggestion that they were at risk, people didn't want to hear about it because it's only gay men and didn't care about them. So there was a roller coaster ride about the attention that was being given to uh, this epidemic. And uh, I remember being told by one of the Sunday news shows, we, we want you on Sunday to talk about AIDS and HIV, but we only want you on it if it turns out that um, oh, the actor, uh, that famous actor, whose name escapes me, Rock Hudson. If it turns out only if Rock Hudson has AIDS. At that point, we didn't know. And um, which showed the way the press thought of the importance of the issue. Here were all these people dying from this disease, but they didn't want to pay attention to it unless Rock Hudson, the celebrity, uh, had, had AIDS and was uh, f going to be uh, killed by the, the disease, which he eventually was. So uh, then they had me on, but it just showed the fickleness of how this disease was treated by the press. So is, is there a lesson that can be drawn about uh, that intersection of science and politics? Because it, it seems like you're saying it clashed then, and do you see it clashing with COVID? Because, you know, just today, we, we had Senator Rand Paul uh, in a hearing uh, clashing with Dr. Anthony Fauci and, uh, and recently uh, President Trump had uh, contradicted Dr. Redfield, the director of the CDC, um, yeah. regarding the importance of wearing face masks and the timing of the vaccine. Well, President, President Trump is looking at this issue from the perspective of his own self-interest in getting re-elected. And he didn't, uh, he didn't want to take responsibility to deal with the uh, uh, COVID-19. He said the state should deal with it. And it's not a problem. And it's going to go away. Uh, he made statements that were just not true. And then when statements came out from the public health people, including people in this administration, his own administration, he wanted to reject those uh, statements and say that they weren't true. Fake news is what he would uh, constantly say when he didn't like a story that was coming out. But uh, 
it's ironic that Tony Fauci, I first met during the AIDS epidemic, and he testified strictly on public health, as did the people in the Reagan administration. But uh, President Trump doesn't want to hear from the public health people because they will say things that are different than the fantasy world that President Trump is making up uh, in order to protect his political interests in failing to deal with this disease, uh, the COVID-19 uh, disease, and trying to stop its spread in the United States. Yeah, as, as you know, the, the, the United States coronavirus death toll just surpassed the 200,000 mm -hmm. mark, and there are uh, 6.8 million people uh, known to have it in the United States, more than in any other country. In, in your view, you know, could the government have done more to limit those numbers? And what, if anything, should we be doing going forward that we're not doing now? Yeah, of course, the government could have done a lot more. The president didn't want to hear what was happening, uh, said it's all going to go away. Uh, but, the, but the scientists were telling us people ought to put on masks. And the scientists were telling us that we ought to keep our distance. We didn't know, and we don't know today, if we're going to get... COVID-19 from somebody who has COVID-19 or is a carrier for COVID, the virus uh, COVID-19. And we see, we see and they see no uh, outward signs that they have this disease. There are people who can look perfectly normal, but be a carrier for the disease. So um, we should have given more attention to this. We should have listened to them and follow through with what they had to say. But if you if you remember President Trump, he didn't want to talk about wearing masks because that would that would look bad for him. And he didn't want to wear a mask himself. And he didn't want people to think that they were going to get this disease because it was going away uh, and in time for his reelection. Uh, so he just ignored the facts. And even today, when 200,000 200, people have died, he said, oh, that was, shows this great success of our efforts from this administration. He just says whatever comes into his brain, and it has nothing to do with what, what reality is happening. It, back in 1990, the Ryan White Cure Act passed 90, ended up passing 95 to 4 with bipartisan support. But yes. it in that, so do, did we have more bipartisan support to address AIDS then uh, than we do with coronavirus now, or do, or do you see bipartisan support now? Well, I think we have bipartisan support to deal with the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. People have been very concerned about this disease. It is not stigmatized the way AIDS was stigmatized. There's not a fear of it although people are frightened if they get it and are frightened for their family and friends who might get it, but it's not being treated the way uh, AIDS was treated. And if anything, we couldn't get money for AIDS research and AIDS uh, efforts. Now the government is throwing money at, uh, at, the, uh, at this COVID because they want to get a cure for it. And so uh, there's no lack of money that's going into dealing with it. There's just a lack of following through with uh, strategies that would stop the transmission of this disease by um, getting people to be tested. We didn't have the tests available. We still don't have tests available in lots of parts of the country. People didn't know if they were infected. They, uh, they, they couldn't t take steps to stop the infection of others. And uh, they didn't follow the public health advisors who were saying wear masks. Uh, uh, in fact, the idea of wearing a mask became a partisan issue. It's hard to believe, but Republicans would not wear masks because they said this is a fake disease, it's not a real issue, and uh, people want them to wear masks because they want to hurt President Trump's reelection. Yeah. And Democrats was yeah. let's follow the scientists. Yeah, it's yeah. not just the politicians either. I, I was just reading about how the singer Van Morrison's described the British government as fascist bullies because they want people to wear masks and follow other health protocols. How do you respond to that? That the argument you see in different countries from different people that this is big government telling us what to do and it's an issue of freedom. 
Well, it's not an issue of freedom. We don't say you can drive as fast as you want. You can drive under the influence of alcohol. You can do whatever you want. There are rules and regulations by which people have to behave so that they're not hurting others. And to put on a mask is a small sacrifice to make to stop the transmission of this disease. Uh, I'm, I'm appalled at the attitude that so many people have, which have, has been encouraged by President Trump uh, in his statements that uh, it's a fake disease and we shouldn't have to do all these things. And freedom should mean that we don't have to do it if we don't want to. We don't tell people that I'm driving drunk and a lot of other circumstances. You know, part of our audience are college students, and we, we've seen outbreaks of coronavirus on campuses in Rhode Island, notably Providence College uh, and the University of Rhode Island. And the Providence Journal just today reported that the Bristol police earlier this month broke up an off-campus house party uh, filled with maskless Roger Williams students. So yeah. I wanted to ask, what lessons uh, can you impart? What, what's your message to today's college students? Well, I think the, the most prudent thing to do is to listen to what's happening from the point of view of those who are uh, scientists and following the disease and are making recommendations to stop the spread of this epidemic. There's another thing I just want to mention because a friend of mine said, well, if you're going to talk to students today, they might not even realize how gay men were discriminated against so bitterly in the early 1980s and of course it went on after that for quite a while uh, it's only recently that we've stopped the discrimination but when people got aids they lost their jobs because you could be fired from your job uh, there's no protection for discrimination based on having a disease that came later in legislation passed uh, uh, on the disability act they had no confidentiality protection if somebody heard that they had AIDS, it could be told from one person to another, and this person could not, not only lose their job, but be shunned by others. If you lost your job in the 1980s, you lost your health insurance, because most people had health insurance through their jobs. So when you lost your job, you lost your health insurance. So the stigma of having AIDS was very, very strong, and, um, and that was the biggest fear people had. They wouldn't come forward to know whether they had uh, HIV or AIDS because uh, they were so vulnerable. Now, uh, I don't think people are so vulnerable to know that they have uh, COVID-19. And they'd like to know, but the administration in charge, the, the uh, president's administration has not provided sufficient tests so people could get tested and know whether they were infected with the disease. That's improved a lot, but there was a long period of time, many, many months, where you just couldn't get that test because we didn't have sufficient tests uh, for, uh, for, to know who had uh, the, the virus and may well transmit it. Yeah, what, it wasn't it, at that point, wasn't it true that Reagan's Attorney General, Siebert, uh, Surgeon General uh, Siebert Koop, um, really provided a powerful rebuttal to the, 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 the line of argument that AIDS was a lifestyle issue. Like at that time, I think the conservative line was that AIDS is, uh, that his, Coop's point to, to that argument was that AIDS is not a no-fault disease. Um, it, you know, it, it, and he insisted otherwise. He, he, he helped turn the debate, didn't he? He was very courageous. He was appointed by President Reagan to be the Surgeon General because he had campaigned around the country against abortions. He was very strongly against abortion. And Reagan's people said, well, let's make him Surgeon General. But the, he looked at the problem from a health point of view and said, we've got to do what is required by the evidence, uh, the, 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 the evidence of what we learn about this disease. And he was shunned by the conservatives, the right wingers, there was a, an event where he was being honored, and I was one of a few members of Congress that showed up. The Republicans en masse stayed away. Now, it's, it's, it was really, really quite political the way they treated uh, uh, Dr. Coop, but he would, he would have none of it. He would say, I'm going to treat this like a health matter, uh, and uh, so I'm going to speak truth to power, 
and he um, he went on and I think became a real hero. Another person who was a real hero in the AIDS epidemic was Dr. Fauci. He had just become head of the institute at, 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 I, uh, at the NIH and was very much in charge of AIDS. And he talked about the scientific evidence and said we shouldn't follow every rumor that people started speaking of, uh, about this disease because a lot of them were just not true and it would panic people. He said, let's stick to the science. And he was a hero then as he's a hero now in dealing with uh, uh, cobra, uh, this, uh, this cobra disease. So what, do you have any thoughts on the, the exchange today between Dr. Fauci and Senator Rand Paul? You know, Rand Paul was uh, criticizing him for being too laudatory to Governor Cuomo, and he was drawing a comparison. He was talking about herd immunity and saying, you know, Sweden's had uh, drawn a comparison to the numbers in Sweden. Any thoughts on that exchange today that just happened? The scientists tell us to get herd immunity, which would mean so many people would have to have the cobra disease that uh, more people won't get it because it will uh, not be effective anymore to be transmitted. Uh, but Dr. Fauci and other scientists said to get there, you'd have to have so many people die from the disease and that we shouldn't allow that to happen. We should try to stop the spread of the disease through common sense things of wearing masks. Um, and, and Senator Paul, who's an optometrist or ophthalmologist, disagreed. And you can see his political thinking. He wanted to disagree with that theory because he, he wanted to scare people about the, the disease. And um, it, it was his point of view from a political point of view, not from a conventional scientific consensus, which he Care, he didn't care to know about, and certainly if he knew about it, ignored. Since, since you're an author of the Affordable Care Act, I wanted to get your thoughts on the Trump administration and yeah. some of the state attorney generals uh, asking the Supreme Court to strike down the entire act as unconstitutional. Um, you know, what are the chances that you see of it being overturned and what's at stake? Well, the Affordable Care Act was a very important piece of legislation to have been passed. Uh, uh, in, in dealing with this medical crisis because it's, it's allowing people to get health insurance even if they've had a disability, even if they've had a pre-existing condition of having COVID. And uh, one of the essential parts of the, uh, of, the, of the Affordable Care Act is you could not be discriminated against in getting insurance because of a pre-existing condition. Well, if the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, is struck by the Supreme Court, which none of us thought would happen after it's already survived other threats in the court, but if, if, uh, if it is thrown out, people could be denied health insurance, they wouldn't have access to purchase health insurance, they'd be discriminated against. Um, it, would, it would be terrible to strike down the only access to health care coverage for uh, people who need it desperately uh, be, be, because of a, uh, a pandemic that's going on. Now, I wouldn't have thought that the Affordable Care Act was endangered because it was challenged in the court and Chief Justice Roberts said, I'm not going to throw this out. I'm not going to declare it unconstitutional. He joined the, the four liberals, deserted the four conservatives, gave the fifth vote to keep it, it uh, constitutional. And his argument was that it's constitutional because it's enforced through the tax code. Well, one of the first things that the Republicans did when Trump was elected and they had control of the House and the Senate was to strike the tax provision that said that if you, um, if, if you don't get health insurance, you have to pay a tax penalty. And they said, no, the penalty was struck. The mandate to get insurance was struck. Therefore, it couldn't be enforced. And because Roberts relied on that, uh, the ACA was unconstitutional. Now, if the court and that they had a district court 
take that point of view, another district court that took a different point of view, but that's what would have been the issue before the Supreme Court. And they even scheduled an argument for the week after the presidential election before the Supreme Court. Now, anybody looking at this would say, uh, they're, they're not gonna throw out the whole law based on such a technical point. Uh, and, and none of us have been that concerned about this case. They could say, okay, that it's not going to be enforced that way, but nevertheless, the law is intended to be enforced uh, and people have to get health insurance, but not because there's a mandate. In fact, the mandate wouldn't be there, but they'd want to get health insurance. People, by and large, want to be covered. They want to be protected. Well, if we end up with a, a, a six uh, to three, Republican conservative majority on the court, even though the chief justice stopped the ACA from being struck down, his vote won't make any difference. There are enough conservative votes at that point uh, to strike the law, and they may well strike it. Then Congress would have to reenact it, but we don't know what we would reenact. President Trump and the Republicans said, we want to repeal the ACA, and replace it, but they have never come up with a replacement. Uh, President Trump said, oh, and of course, everybody would be protected from pre-existing conditions. But how does he say that if the law is no longer considered constitutional and that provision is no longer in the law? It would be a very tough job to get another law passed, but the court may say it's unconstitutional, let Congress try to fix it. So we've got some questions in the uh, chat, um, but before we get to those, just let me, you mentioned the Supreme Court. I just want to get your thoughts about uh, the president's plans. He, he said he plans to name a uh, new uh, selection for the Supreme Court on Saturday uh, to fill the seat mm. vacated by the death of uh, Justice Ginsburg. Who do you expect him to choose? Is, do you see any way for Democrats to halt the confirmation? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's we've... We just look at it as the height of hypocrisy, because when President Obama had 11 months to go in his term, uh, he appointed a, 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 a candidate for a justice on the Supreme Court to re uh, replace the death, the, the uh, justice that died. And he said, I'm doing this. It's the Constitution says the president will appoint this. Senate will confirm or reject. And the Senate wouldn't even uh, take up the nomination. They said, let's let the, have, let's let the people decide this issue when they elect the president in uh, 2016. And then that new president will make the decision. He just made that up. There was nothing in the Constitution that required him to wait. And now that he re he's faced with the opposite position, that uh, uh, we have a new president that's going to be elected very, very soon. And uh, the, the president has already been established to let the president make the selection of the, of the vacancy for the court. Uh, uh, Senator, Mc Senator McConnell says, oh, that's not a precedent. We don't have to follow it. Our job is to, uh, is to uh, move uh, and decide on the nominee that the president places in front of us. We can ignore everything that happened. There are f clips being shown on news shows of Republican senators who said, we have no right to fill this vacancy. The next president should fill it when it came to the earlier vacancy. But now they say, we have a solemn obligation to fill the vacancy if the president sends a name to us. Now the president said he's going to name a woman and there are two women on the circuit courts that are being considered, uh, both very, very conservative, fit with, uh, with his uh, philosophy. And he uh, wants to, uh, and he said he's gonna make it an announcement and appoint one of them. And he wants the, the Senate to act on, those, on the appointment that he's going to make before the election. Well, that's an extraordinarily short period of time. There will not be adequate time to investigate this appointment. It will just be rushed through by the Republicans on a partisan basis, because I don't see Democrats voting for it. There are two Republican senators said they won't vote for it. 
uh, and uh, but it, that's not enough to stop it. The Democrats really don't have any bullets on this. Because the president appoints somebody, and it's up for consideration. Uh, then Senator McConnell is going to force the issue to be brought up the week before the election, and with straight Republican votes, have it have that individual confirmed even though it was contrary to their actions and their opinions and how this should be treated. Uh, and it will only uh, exacerbate the very nasty partisan mood that the Congress and the uh, White House has, has been in, failing to work together uh, since Trump became president, even before. But it got so much worse during this Trump administration in working with the Democrats. So we've got some questions from our, our, our viewers. Uh, let me ask a few of those. Uh, how long did acute miscommunication and political denial last at the beginning of, of the AIDS epidemic compared to the beginning of COVID? Oh, she's, she said all relative, of course. The advent of internet speeds up both in misinformation but also dissemination of public health guidance. So how does that compare? Well, we had information readily available with the AIDS epidemic. Uh, it was at first uh, extensively covered, and people knew how it was transmitted. There were some outliers who were saying that you could get it. There was one woman who said she got it from a dentist treatment, but that just uh, didn't hold up. Uh, we held a hearing on it. Her testimony did not hold up. But we knew very early, and people generally accepted it, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, that this disease was affecting gay men and people who had blood transfusions or people who were sharing needles for uh, uh, illicit drugs. And nobody else was really in harm's way. So we knew the information about AIDS. The only objection that we had were from right wingers like Senator Helms, who said, if you try to educate people about how not to transmit the disease, uh, uh, it won't discourage gay men from engaging in gay sex. And so we won't want to tell them how it's transmitted. We'll keep that a secret from them, as if they weren't going to engage in gay sex anyway, or share needles or do anything else. It was a ridiculous position. But finally, uh, President Reagan came around. The Republicans were coming around. It wasn't a partisan issue. We had uh, strong Republican support, uh, as well as Democratic support, who wanted to follow what the health people were telling us, except for those few right-wingers like Bill Dannemeyer, who was a congressman from, I'm sorry to say, California, and Senator Helms. But uh, others came around and, uh, and supported the uh, Ryan White Act when we had it uh, before us. One other question. A number of grassroots organizations such as Rhode Island Project AIDS provided essential valid information to anyone in the community. Can similar grassroots organizations provide um, information where the government has failed us? Well, the grassroots organization can supply information where people have not gotten that uh, story from the government. Although the government is being up to date now uh, they've been embarrassed uh, when some of the statements they've made have turned out not to be true. But by and large, we've get, we're getting the right information from the government and from the health groups. What we're getting pushback is from uh, the, the, some of the right-wing groups and the president of the United States, who's a significant player because he's the, he is the president of the United States. And a lot of people believe what he has to say thinking he knows what he's talking about, even though he's clearly not, does, he may know, well, he certainly does know, in my view, what he's saying, but he doesn't care how misleading and harmful what he's saying may be to this spread of this disease and how many people will die as a result of his, his knowing and mis spread of misinformation. In, in your opinion, would more government action have been taken to control COVID if it was stigmatized? Would that type of fear have been more effective in a sense than the fear of simply contracting COVID? I don't think it would have made any difference. Uh, the fear was not fear of the disease. The fear was the fear that President Trump might 
uh, pay a price at the in the election because he didn't want to acknowledge this disease. If he acknowledged the disease, he had to acknowledge that he didn't do things to stop it. The only thing he's ever said he did was stop people from coming in from China. Well, you know, give me a break. The transmission of the disease came in from Europe as well as from Asia, and it was being transmitted just by being in the same place. Now, they didn't know that they should avoid getting together with people who might be able to spread uh, COVID-19. Uh, and so uh, if, if it were stigmatized, uh, it, it, thank goodness it wasn't because a job would be harder. But the job that the president should have taken on as the leader of this country, he failed us miserably. And many people have died un unnecessarily because of it. Um. Another question. One of the strings tied to the funding associated with the Ryan White Cares Act was the requirement that states adopt laws that criminalize the intentional transmission of HIV. How did that stipulation end up in the act? Um, because it ended up undermining public health prevention efforts. I don't recall that provision. I may be wrong, but I don't recall a provision that's the only way that uh, states and local governments were going to get money to combat this disease or the federal government was going to be able to spend money at the federal level if they uh, made that statement. Um, it wasn't certainly uh, given any credence in the way the disease was handled. We gave a lot of money to local governments uh, because the local governments were the ones who were handling uh, the, uh, the, 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 the epidemic and uh, giving the treatments, the federal government provided a lot of legislation to do it and federal dollars for especially for research. But um, what was being done under the Ryan White Act was uh, supported by almost everybody ex except those who didn't want to even talk about uh, the spread of the HIV AIDS. Uh, the, the biggest fight we had was from right wingers who didn't want people to know that if they shared needles, they could get um, the disease, which made no sense. Uh, or that if they were engaged in gay sex, they could get this disease. It, it was ridiculous to try to withhold that information. It was important information for people to have. Um, I, I know my time at Roger Williams, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, focus of academic work on climate change. And I, so before you go, I wanted you to yeah. address uh, how that ties in with the wildfires that we see in your home state. It's, it's pretty clear. And the, and the reporters who talk about the wildfires make it especially obvious that what we're seeing in the wild temperatures and and fires and s floods and all these things that are strange things that are happening in our climate are tied to climate change it's and we fail to do anything about climate change uh, again another case where the people in government especially the president doesn't care what the scientists have to say president trump campaigned against the idea that climate change was a reality. So this is, this, is, this is fake news. And he denounced it and didn't want to do anything, except when he became president, he eased up on all of the things that the Environmental Protection Agency had been doing to stop making this problem worse. Uh, he repealed a lot of the provisions and, uh, and, and it, it is, it's more difficult to, to deal with climate change now that he's president and is not giving any leadership and in fact is giving leadership contrary to to containing uh the the carbon emissions that are causing uh the 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 warming of our planet and the uh, harm by our uh climate all around the world uh look let me just say something unequivocally uh, we could survive four years of president trump and the climate change issue if we get busy doing something starting immediately come January. But if President Trump is reelected, uh, we will face a situation where the climate change issue will get worse because the emissions go up into the air. They don't disappear. 
they stay there in the atmosphere. They add, are additive to the other climate change emissions that are there. And we won't be able to do anything about it. Uh, you can't get rid of those emissions. Our only strategy has to be to stop adding to it until we have some scientific way to do something that re would reduce the carbon emissions that are stored there. But I don't see any leadership from a President Trump in the next four years. And I think it's just going to be too late for us. We're going to have to learn to adapt to climate change and the harm that it will bring. We don't know quite how to adapt to it, except people are going to have to move and not live in certain areas. Uh, there, there are going to be people who are going to have to uh, pick up and not only move, but try to relocate to some other area. There's going to be tremendous, uh, tremendous damage that's going to be done to uh, uh, this, this planet. And it's you have to ask, why would we take a risk on the only planet where we live on allowing climate change to be uh, go, uh, to, to be added to and to become uh, more harm and uh, a threat to our life on this planet. Very good to ask you about one more issue before we let you go. I know you've uh, weighed in over the years about net neutrality. And yeah. I was wondering if you see any prospects of Congress addressing that in the near future. Yeah, I have been a strong advocate for net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality would say that uh, that uh, on the internet, the the those who are controlling the internet, like the service providers, cable or broadcasters and others, couldn't discriminate on the kinds of shows that would be available to consumers uh, by adding uh, barriers to them getting those shows. And uh, we wanted legislation to be passed. I authored legislation to provide for net neutrality. It didn't pass, but the FCC adopted net neutrality rules. But when President Trump got elected, the new FCC repealed those rules. Those uh, repeals were challenged uh, in the courts. And the rules can be reestablished if we get a new FCC with a new president. But if this issue uh, goes before the, the 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 Trump appointees, even if they're new appointees, they're not going to do anything about net neutrality. And we're going to find that uh, there's going to be a lot of discrimination of what we are allowed to see on, on the Internet and what will be permitted to us to be transmitted to the public uh, through uh, the Internet itself. Very good. Well, thank you uh, very much, Congressman, for uh, this discussion tonight. I think we've covered a lot of ground, and I will turn it over to Betsy and Adam uh, to conclude. Good. Yeah, thank I'll, you. I'll just add thank, thanks to both of you for an informative talk and discussion and given, obviously, everybody much to think about. Um, I also uh, would be remiss to not recommend the book by Congressman Waxman, the <laughs> okay. Waxman Report. Um, which um, really looks at some of the signature legislation. He writes about the, the signature le uh, legislation and really what it took much in the same way we heard a little bit about the, the Ryan White Act, the, the process, the sl often slow process. Um, and the, and, and I, I believe the, the book makes the case that it is a slow process. Um, legislating is a slow process to, to, to get it right. Um, I'd like to thank you both as well. Um, Henry, um, one of my best friends died of, died of AIDS when I was uh, had my first job after college in 1980. 1980. And um, so the AIDS epidemic is really near and dear to my heart. And I appreciate the service that you gave and still give to this country for all your years in, in the Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Adam, it's so great to see you. <laughs> Take care. We'll give a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to everybody for coming and attending tonight through your Wi-Fi problems and everything else. So. Yes. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you to all for coming tonight.